Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. We're here with Dr. Dimsdale Zucker from Columbia, and she's gonna to talk to us about how the brain supports memory and imaging mechanisms uh, that are used to study it. Um, so welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I just wanted to start off with some questions. Uh, what initially got you excited about science? A really good question. I i um, been involved in science since I was a freshman in college, and in a way I got involved a bit by accident. So when I was going to college, everyone around me in my life was like, Hallie, you're going to be a therapist. Hallie, you're going to be a teacher. Hallie, you're going to work with kids. Um, and I got to college and I didn't know what I was going to do. My friends used to call me Undie for undecided. Um, and I did my undergrad training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And Michigan does an incredible job of getting its undergraduates involved in primary work, science research, other poli-sci, language work, all that stuff. And I thought of the things that people told me I was going to do, what resonated the most was that I was going to be a therapist. And I didn't know what that meant. And I thought, oh, I guess that means you take a psychology class. And I got involved in this research program called UROP, Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program, where you went and you interviewed in a lot of different research labs. And then you took a I think it was like 10 hours a week a job. Um, and I just applied to a bunch of psychology labs because that was as close as what I thought to uh, being a therapist. But I was like, I'm definitely not gonna be a researcher because researchers don't have social skills and they're really boring and they're not gonna be nice. And who would wanna be like a research scientist? And I was so wrong. I like totally got bitten by the bug. I worked in a lab with amazing people. I worked with Patty Roy Lorenz at Michigan and she was an incredible mentor and she was not antisocial and she was super friendly and the people in her lab were like that too. Um, and I just kind of started doing research when I was 18 in her lab and have never stopped. Um, and I just realized that I really loved it and that I really hated the idea of being a therapist. I worked for a while at the veterans hospital doing intake batteries to get some clinical experience. And I thought, this is terrible. I love doing primary um, basic science research and, and that's really what my passion is. So it was very accidental, but I'm super glad that I fell into it. Awesome, that's great. And um, so what, what have been some of your favorite parts or favorite moments um, as you've been on this primary research trajectory? I think the fact that science is an international community just kind of always blows my mind. And I think about this when I'm able to go to conferences in person or even during COVID, all the talk series that have been virtual. I have this amazing meeting that happens once a month where the rest of the researchers are all in Europe. And when I step back and think about that there's people all over the world putting their heads together to try to solve problems, that makes me really excited because it makes me feel like we're actually gonna figure some things out um, and that it's people getting involved at every level. So I have students who work with me who are actually high school students, uh, college students. I work with other um, graduate students, postdocs, faculty, and people all over. I have a collaborator in Poland, I have a collaborator on the West Coast. So the fact that it's really a community of people putting their heads together to figure out the, the problems that are facing the world, um, I think is what really makes me feel passionate about science. I don't think about science as being, you know, ever being a solo act. Um, and, and I love that, that sense of it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I know, at least for me, like I grew up with the image of you know, the 1800s scientist alone in his lab, <laughs> you know, very male centric, very white centric, uh, but that's just not the case for modern science at all anymore. It's no, not at all. Cross country, it's, it's awesome. And I'm so glad we've gotten away from that. Only old white men can do science model because I think that it really limits the scope of ideas and the way that we think about solving problems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, can I ask if you have any advice for like young undergraduates or, or kids who might be thinking, well, science seems really cool. I don't know where to start or like who to ask or what to do first. Do you yeah. have any little bits of advice for that? Yeah, I think I would say like science can be for you. I think just like we were talking about, there are all these stereotypes around, you know, if you ask 
a lot of kids to like draw a scientist, they do tend to still draw like a white man often. And it's great. White men should be able to do science and non-white men should be able to do science and non-binary individuals and women and people of color and science is for everyone. And I think that's what I would say to people is don't let that, um, try, try not to let that intimidate you and, and to get involved and find what you're passionate about. Um, but I think I would also say something that I've really been struck by in the high school students that I've worked with in particular is how much pressure students are putting on themselves to get you know, 50 experiences on their CV, their vitas are like longer than mine. And I've, you know, been in graduate school for six years. I worked for three years before that. I've been a postdoc for two years. Um, and, and some of these people walk in with papers on their vitas and all sorts of stuff that was never, ever on my radar. Um, and so I think my advice would also be to try to step back and not put that pressure on yourself. So try something out. If you like it, awesome keep scratching that itch and finding what makes you passionate. If you don't like that, try something else. If you try science and you're like, actually my passion is Russian literature from the 1800s, go scratch that itch and, and figure out if that's your passion. So I would say, don't worry so much about trying to build up experiences and build up what's on your CV. Just worry about going out and trying some things and taking risks and, um, you know, there's no one path. You can be on one path for a while and you can always deviate from it. And you can always get back on the path you were on before. So try to give yourself some grace and some some freedom and take that pressure off. And I think just try to focus on what, what makes you happy and what you're passionate about. And and I think the rest will sort of try to, try to fall in place from there. Awesome, thank you so, so much. Uh, I will let you go ahead and get started. And everyone, please interrupt with questions or put them down in the chat and I, we can do the interrupting for you. And um, yeah, take it away. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And yes, I really um, wanna echo what Abra and I just said, please interrupt with questions. I'm happy to go a little bit longer than you guys normally do. No problem. I love talking about this stuff. I'm really passionate about it. So what I really wanna to talk to you all today is about some of the techniques um, that I've used in my own work to study human memory. And so I'll cover two techniques largely, EEG electroencephalography and functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. And hopefully by the time I'm done today, um, those words won't sound quite so much like mumbo jumbo jargon and you'll be able to, to understand at least the, the basics of what they are. Okay, ah, instead of advancing my slide, I minimized my grid. There we go. Um, so let's start just zooming out a little bit. I've studied the brain for some time, but I recognize that not everyone on this call um, might have ever studied the brain. So here um, is an image of a, this is a human brain that's been removed. It's um, put in some fixatives. So it doesn't look exactly like this in your body, but just a rough sense. Everyone of course knows where their brain is. Right? I don't need to tell you where it is in your body, but, but I wanted to give people a sense of kind of what it looks like. And the brain is composed of these cell structures called neurons. Excuse me, and this slide depicts um, two neurons that are in communication with with one another and it depicts the, the classic parts of the neuron, these tree-like spiny bits, the dendrites, um, here's the soma or sort of the brains of the cell. If you've learned about nuclei in a biology class, you can think of this being related to that concept. And then we have the axon. This is like the send arm of the neuron and uh, the synapse or the part that joins to the next neuron. And, and what's also depicted here is this myelin sheath or this um, kind of like the plastic coating on your telephone wires, it acts as a conductive aid. Can you all see my mouse cursor as I'm pointing at things? Yeah, okay, cool, I'm getting some thumbs up. So the reason I'm stepping back and thinking about neurons is neurons um, really provide the fundamental backbone of how communication is working in the brain. So we, I like to think about there being two major um, forms of communication. So one is chemical or what are called neurotransmitters. You've probably heard things like these tossed around if you've heard of dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine. These are different chemicals that are endogenous or that is they're natural in the body and they're one of the ways that um, the brain communicates with itself. And the other is electrical. These are the action potentials. So this is what the neurons are sending to one another. So just at a really high schematic level, what's happening is we have this neuron, right? These are the parts that we pointed out before the dendrites, 
following out to the axon, um, this axon terminal that's going to synapse on the next neuron. And what happens is that the information flows from one neuron down to the next. So this action potential, this electrical impulse gets sent. Um, there's a buildup of charge that essentially you can think of it like there's the neurons like tabulating the messages. Once it gets enough evidence, it go ahead and it sends its action potential. The action potential both includes a release of electrical activity um, and can involve a release of chemicals and neurotransmitters. And this is how the message gets passed from one neuron to another. Um, a really classic schematic of how we can think about neuronal communication is like a game of telephone. If you've ever played with your friends where you start with one word and you say that word to the next person and so on and so forth. So that's the actual like neuronal activity, the neuron to neuron communication. And we want to think about how we could measure that directly. So a lot of um, this work would need to be done by actually putting in a recording electrode um, because these signals are electrical. So this can be done in a Petri dish. So sort of removing the cells from inside the body. Um, and these kinds of work can be done in non-human animals. I should also say you can put recording electrodes directly into the brain of living, um, behaving animals. Um, you can also do this in humans uh, who've had these electrodes implanted for other medical reasons. So there's a disorder called epilepsy. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may even have it. It's actually incredibly common in which individuals have seizures. That is, um, you can think of it like there's a little thunder and lightning storm that happens in their brain. And this can cause some shaking. Um, and in patients where it's not responsive to medication, they sometimes need to undergo surgery. And before the doctors will do surgery, they'll put in recording electrodes to see where the seizures are starting. So um, there have been some really special cases where scientists have been allowed to look at these measurements. Um, we don't just want to like stick electrodes in people willy nilly, but this has been a really um, generous gift that these patients have given us to allow us to, to capitalize on these medical treatments they're having, but to help us understand the brain. And this is one of the ways that we can record neuronal activity directly in awake behaving humans. So these are sort of more invasive ways of measuring, actually putting in a recording probe. But we can also measure the activity from populations of neurons at the scalp, that is, at the surface of, of the brain. And one of the ways that we can do that is with this technique called EEG. So EEG um, stands for electroencephalography. That's kind of a mouthful. But if we break this term down, um, I think it makes sense what the technique is doing. So the electro part, we're going to think about as being electrical. So just like I told you, neurons communicate with these electrical action potentials. That's where that electro part of the word comes from. Encephalo means relating to the brain. So these are recordings that are taken from and of the brain. And graphy um, means this field of study. So electrical relating to the brain field of study. We're unpacking this big word, EET, electroencephalography. OK. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Absolutely. How? So is the only difference between that and like an EKG that you would get on your heart, is it the same technology? It's just that this is for your brain instead? That's my basic understanding that essentially yeah. both are recording electrodes and it's just what you're recording differs. Right. I'm sure cool. there might be some nuanced differences like in the way the you equipment works, but at a high level, yes, that's yeah. roughly cool. the same. EMG, electro oh, myogram, muscular gram. The M is something to do with muscles is a similar approach. Anyone else have questions? Feel free to jump on in. Thanks for that, Natalie. Okay. So EEG involves putting recording electrodes on the scalp. I'll show you a picture of what these look like in a second. And these just sit on top of your hair, or if you're bald, on top of your bare head. Nothing actually gets like inserted into your brain, unlike the um, epilepsy patients I was telling you about earlier. Um, we use a cap, it kind of looks like a swim cap, um, and we use that so that we can standardize the placement of the electrodes or the recording sensors across our participants. We use a little bit of gel, it actually looks just like hair gel, and that's to increase the conductivity. Remember that electricity is going to travel better in something like um, where we can make a direct contact, it's going to dissipate really quickly in the air, and so we want to be able to bridge that connection from the scalp to the recording sensor. Um, 
EEG is primarily thought of for having really fast temporal resolution on the order of milliseconds, but relatively coarse spatial resolution. So that is, I can say generally where something may be maximal along the cortical surface, um, but I can't confidently tell you, oh, it came from exactly this place in the brain. But usually this can get us close enough to have some rough sense of, of what's going on. So here are some pictures I took of myself while I was in graduate school um, when I was doing EEG recordings. So here I am wearing this cap. We don't have all the recording sensors in, but we have some of them. So you put some on the person's face. These are actually used to help reject eye blink artifacts um, because the eye is a dipole. Every time you blink, you actually get a huge negativity um, in the signal. And you can see the rest of these are scattered throughout my brain, I'm sorry, my head. Um, and the, this like little tail that I have is all the the cords basically from the electrodes. And here one of my wonderful research assistants, Aria Ferradoni, has this like artistic setup that I just love of all the recording sensors. Every time I look at this, I feel very like at peace. Maybe I should like submit it to the MoMA um, as a beautiful um, piece of modern art. But here we can see the recording sensors not on the scalp um, and different um, caps. And then these are all the tools that we use to do the setup. So we use these plastic syringes that are filled with that gel that I told you increasing the conductivity. Um, and here are some sterile tipped uh, cotton swabs, things like that, that we use to clean the surface before we go ahead and put the cap on. And um, when I was in graduate school, my wonderful team of research assistants helped me make some videos that go over how to do the capping. So I don't think I have the audio turned on on these, but I'll just show you a little bit of this. In case anyone's interested, they're all up on a, um, a you can find them on my website and, and they're all public. So if you really want to see us do some capping, um, feel free. So this is me being set up by my research assistant, Neha Bhubanesh. So I'll just play this for a little bit. Yeah, I don't have the audio on, but what she's explaining here is that she's taking the cap. It's kind of like a swim cap. She's going to pull it apart um, so that it fits over my head. Um, and she's saying she's going to move my hair out of the way because the hair can be uh, cause some interference um, if it gets in the way between that recording sensor um, and the gel. So she's gonna, in just a moment, like slip that on me. It's an elasticated cap. It really doesn't hurt very much. I mean, doesn't hurt at all. Um, feels just like a, a swim cap going on if anyone's worn one of those or a shower cap, if you ever wear one of those in the shower. So Aria is giving her a hand, just pulling it over my head. There it goes on. And Meha here is just filling some of the sensor holes with this gel. So what she's saying that she's doing, um, my wonderful research assistants developed their own little method where they would take their phone cameras and shine it in so that they could see where the gel was going and make sure that they got a really good connection. Um, I think people underestimate the uh, impact of having really incredible research assistants and how crucial they are to the day-to-day -day operation of, of getting science done. So these two individuals were so incredibly helpful in collecting my dissertation data um, and they've both gone on to do wonderful things. So sure you can see her showing you the, the gel going in the cap and she's going to snap in the recording electrode into that site. Okay, um, I've been talking about how the EEG method is really widely used and it um, can actually be used in kids all the way up to older adults, things like that. But I did want to talk about that um, just as we are starting off our conversation that science historically has been done by um, white men and there can be some biases that are introduced, uh, you know, hopefully inadvertently into the field by doing that. And, and one example, great example of that I think is the way that EEG caps are designed. So if you think about populations that you know, don't have a lot of hair, maybe like balding white men or people who have thinner, um, more um, Caucasian style hair, you think no problem, we just move that hair out of the way. Um, and there's been a big um, push to say that there's actually some biases in the way that these caps have been created and they're not, um, when they were initially created, they, they didn't take into consideration the real variety of hair textures and densities that exist, largely in the, the Black community that you can have coarser hair textures and um, that traditional EEG sensors don't do a great job of picking that up. 
Um, and so there's been some really clever redesigns happening that I'm really excited to see in the field to enable us to get good quality data from a larger subset of the population. And I think this is so important because we want our research to be generalizable and we don't want only to be able to draw conclusions about what some people call weird um, populations, white, uh, educated, industrialized, I don't remember the rest, but we really want our science to be for everyone and applicable to everyone. And so I think this is a great example of how bringing more voices into the field um, exposed an existing bias and has come up with a really beautiful solution to it. Okay, so I wanted to show you a little bit of the raw EEG data. Um, this again is data that I was collecting during my dissertation. Um, this is actually very messy data. We are trying to troubleshoot a problem. So I'll explain what it's gonna look like and then I'll play a little um, snippet of the video. So all these um, rainbow colored lines are the raw electrical traces from the recording sensors. I think this is actually me being recorded in this. So all the recording sensors on my scalp. What you would want to see in beautiful clean data is that these lines should look really straight, maybe just a tiny bit wiggly. And we can tell that there's a problem in my data because it has this periodicity, this like, um, it looks like waves in the ocean. Um, and so that's the problem we are trying to solve. We can see these really large deflections reflected here. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but they have this inverted polarity. It looks kind of like a U. And these are the times that I'm blinking my eyes. So because I had a recording sensor above and a recording sensor below, um, we get this flipping in polarity that can be seen in these ocular channels or the eye channels here. Um, and so those are used as control sites so that we can reject and remove the eye blink because blinking your eyes isn't actually related to brain activity. Okay, let me play this through for all of you. So here we can see there's a little bit of um, noise in the data. This probably comes from clenching my jaw. Here we see an eye blink. Here's an, um, another set of characteristic eye blinks. And again, we see this probably alpha, which is just one of the frequencies in the data that's, that we were trying to, to troubleshoot in, in this case. Here's another time that I probably like Oh, clenched my jaws. So we can see that there are definitely signals that you can see in that raw EEG with the naked eye, but none of the things that we're seeing here are raw brain activity that's related to, to something that the subject or the participant is seeing on the screen. And so to move from that raw EEG signal to what we call an ERP or an event-related potential, we have to do a couple of things. So we can see large signals in the raw EEG, like I showed you those eye blinks or when I clenched my jaw, but we can't make any conclusions about responses to individual stimuli or experimental conditions. In this data that I collected in my PhD thesis, I was exposing people to images on the screen that either were old studied images or new images. And I was looking for voltage differences in brain activity for when someone correctly remembered studying an old item versus correctly um, rejected not having seen a new item. And those kind of small voltage changes are not able to be seen in that raw EEG data that I was just showing you. So for that, we have to do a couple more things. What we need to do is average across lots and lots of trials. So we need to show people lots and lots of different pictures, some of which they remembered, some of which they forgot, some of which they correctly rejected as being new. And the reason we do this is the averaging gets rid of any activity that is unique to the trials or that isn't common um, because the activity that's not locked to the cognitive processes is randomly distributed. So um, I'll show you an example of this in just a minute, but if you think about things being random and offset, if you had lots and lots and lots of them, if you average them all together, they're gonna wash out or average out to be essentially zero. And these average signals are what are called event-related potentials. They're called this because they're activity that is time-locked or can be uniquely lined up to one event in time. And usually the event is something like the presentation of a picture or a, a sound, something like that. Sorry, my dog is pacing behind me. You may see him pop up in the couch in a second. Okay, so here I'm just showing some classic examples um, from um, Steve Luck and Marta Kudis and Steve Hilliard. Um, so Steve Luck, this is coming from one of his textbooks. So this is just a um, schematic of what EEGs might look like. So in panel B up at the top here, he's showing you, you know, this 
raw EEG trace. And it just looks super noisy, right? It kind of looks like I did like a random scribble with my pen. And what he's showing you is that there's some trials, he's calling them X and O trials. And for example, on this first X trial, there's what Steve would call an uppy and then a downy and then an uppy and then a downy. This X trial starts with a smaller uppy and a bigger downy and so on and so forth. And these O trials, you know, have these larger dips. We can kind of see if we squint like, well, these O trials have these big downward going deflections that we don't tend to see as much in the X trials, but it's actually pretty hard to visually discern what's going on in a trial by trial basis just from looking at these single trials. But what Steve did here in this figure is he took 80 of these X trials and, and um, a large set of these O trials. And when you average them together, you wash out this really high frequency wiggly noise. And what you're left with is um, more characteristic changes. And what we can see, right, is the X trials have this negative going deflection. Um, and the O trials have an even more negative going deflection. So we can discern differences between these trial types that sort of pop out after we've done averaging across lots and lots of events. This is real data coming from Marta Kudis, um, depicted here on the left, one of probably the most famous language researchers um, still, still around. And what she did, um, this is all the individual um, subject e raw EEG traces. These letters here just depict that they're coming from different sites. Um, so just like we use uh, north, south, east, west, if we're orienting ourselves on a map, we use different um, location markers to orient ourselves on the head. So FZ means it's a frontal site, kind of near the um, forehead. CZ is like the top of our, the crown of our head and PZ would be back here towards what's called the parietal lobe. So what she's showing you is that if we looked across individual subjects, yeah, we kind of see something that rises and then something that falls, but it's so hard to make out a signal through all this noise. But if we average all these trials across all these subjects, we can see this really beautiful characteristic pattern. This is the N400, um, which is tied to um, when we detect incongruities in language. So Marta Kudis would do studies like she'd have people read sentences one, one word at a time where they might see something like, I take my coffee with cream and socks. And when you get to the word socks, that's really unexpected and you get this, um, this deflection in the EEG. So how do we relate event-related potentials to cognition? I should actually pause before I get there just to ask, does anyone have questions on, on the basics of EEG, what we're measuring, or how we get from EEGs to ERPs? OK. So when we're performing some mental operation, like reading a sentence, if you were in Marta Kudis' study, or remembering an item that was studied or not, like if you're a participant in one of mine, a similar set of neural events, that is those action potentials, the, the communication in the brain is not identical every time, but very similar. So if we have lots and lots of repetitions of this cognitive operation that we see across a number of different um, trials, we can then estimate those event-related potentials by averaging across all of those trials. And um, I'm just noting here that we don't usually care about like the exact features of the ERP itself, but rather what we're interested in is comparing two different states. So in my studies, I often compare remembered and forgotten or old items and new items. And what I want to see is that there's a difference in what the ERPs look like for those differing conditions. And from that, we can make an inference that there's a different mental operation or different cognitive process that's going on. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So when you average a lot of signals after these different stimuli, um, how do you move from there toward the like conclusion of like, oh, the event or the way our brain processes, like confusion at seeing something new uh, and like spatially map that, I guess. Um, is there a way to say, oh, I think this signal because it's more parietal centric it's being processed there or does that, is that too simplistic? Not too simplistic. And it's, I think what a lot of ERP researchers want to be able to say. And because of the way electrical activity spreads, um, it's actually a really complicated physics problem to solve exactly where the signal is originating from. You can think about this as if you were throwing a stone into a lake. If you measured, right from where the stone hit, you would get one pattern of results. If you measured from 
a foot away, you'd get another pattern of results. And if you measured from three feet away, you'd get another pattern of results. All three of the places that you measured in the lake would indicate that there was some disturbance in the surface of the lake, but you would make a completely different inference about where you think the stone was dropped based on that. In the example where you're throwing a stone, you have one inciting event, the stone, and you can therefore mathematically solve that problem. It's like a bounded, um, uh, I, I forget the math word, but it's, it's like a perfectly constrained problem. You have sort of enough variables in your system of equations that you can solve it. The reason this is a much harder problem to solve with EEG is that you essentially have an, I don't want to say infinite because you don't have an infinite number of neurons, but the way you're solving it, like there's an infinite number of places in the brain that that activity could have initiated from and it's just about where you measured it at. So we want to be really careful with the way that we're describing the effects. And I'm going to show you actually in this slide an example of what it looks like when we map um, activity across the scalp. And I'll um, try to highlight what I mean about um, being just really careful about the way we interpret it. So this is an example of a memory-related potential. So the black line shows um, brain activity when subjects were calling an item, correctly calling an item old. That is, they actually studied the item previously. And this dashed navy blue line um, is the activity when you're correctly calling an item new. And what we can see is that there's a voltage difference between these that arises somewhere after 500 milliseconds. What they're showing you is that there's a recording site here in the left parietal. This would kind of be here on my own head. And they're saying, look, if we record here and we plot what this voltage looks like spread across the whole scalp, it kind of looks like this. So we can clearly see that the activity is maximal at this parietal site, but we can also see that it really spreads across the scalp such that if I were to have measured it from a recording sensor here, I also would be able to say that there is some condition difference. But if I were to plot it across the scalp, it would look really different than when I measure from the parietal site. So that's why what we want to do is draw a conclusion about condition differences and describe where we're measuring the effect from and plot that effect. But we don't want to get really hung up on the idea that like this is where the effect originates from. Does that answer your question, Aubriana? Yeah, really well, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Anyone else have questions about this? This is like a fallacy that I think a lot of um, scientists make in when they interpret their data. And, and so I'm really glad you brought up that issue. Okay. So um, I'm just gonna give a quick uh, recap of EEG and then we'll move on to, to fMRI. So EEG is a direct measure of neural activity. It has high temporal precision. And ERPs, or event-related potentials, we get by averaging together EEG activity across lots and lots of trials. Many cognitive processes, we've talked about both language and memory, but many other things, face processing, emotion processing, all sorts of things, have specific ERP components that are associated with them. Okay. So I want to turn now to how we're going to measure neural activity indirectly. Um, let's see, my keyboard just told me it disconnected. Sorry for this. Technical difficulties and my dog's barking. Theo, honey, I'm giving a talk. Can we use a quiet voice? I know someone might be at your door. Can I have a touch? Thank you. Thank you for changing your mind. Thank you. So sorry, everyone. The very uh, sensitive door security system. Um, okay. So how can we take indirect measures of neural activity? So one technique that we can use that I've also used in my own work is called functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. Um, so it's an indirect measure of neural activity or brain activity. It's sensitive to the changes in oxygenation levels. So this um, is a signal that's called blood oxygen level dependent or the bold signal. Although, um, and, and the way that I think about this is kind of similar to, to a runner. So when you're sitting at your desk, you, you know, maybe you're just breathing however often you breathe. You don't, you're not taking in a ton of oxygen. But if you go run a race, you need to take in way more oxygen because you need that oxygen to sustain your body at that faster speed. And I think about the same way, same thing happening in your brain. That when um, you're really 
pulling resources or really using a particular brain region to engage in a specific cognitive operation, it requires more resource. And that resource is oxygenated blood. So the brain is always working all the time and there's always processes going on. But let's say you're trying to retrieve a memory. And so this means that you really need to ramp up activity in a structure I'll talk about in the minute um, called the hippocampus or in your medial prefrontal cortex um, or in your parietal cortex, all areas related to memory search. So the body is gonna send more resource that is more oxygenated blood. Just like when you're running, you take a big breath of air to give your muscles more energy to move. I, uh, don't really believe in uh, watering things down even um, for, for younger audiences. And so I feel like I have to say that there's still active scientific debate, um, but this is one pretty largely accepted view of, of how fMRI is working. But I think we can still make really interesting conclusions from fMRI, even if there's competing theories about what exactly it's measuring. But um, for your purposes, it would be uh, totally kosher for you to say that it's a, a blood oxygen dependent signal and to think about it this way. But you may, as you uh, type upper level psychology classes here, that there's still some active debate. So I'll just leave that out there to entice your curiosity. So um, we're able with this technique both to take pictures of anatomy. So many of you may have heard of an MRI. Um, you might have had them for a medical purpose. So I hurt my knee. Um, the other year and I had to have an MRI. It's the same machine as that I use at work to take functional MRI um, pictures of the brain. MRI is um, non-invasive. It doesn't require any needles or injections or anything. That's super, um, super easy. It's safe for most people in most ages, as long as you don't have metal in your body, because the MRI environment is a really strong magnetic field. And as long as you aren't claustrophobic, because it's a relatively small space. I'll show you in just a minute what it looks like for those of you who, who aren't already familiar with it. Okay, so how do we move from MRI to fMRI? So it's the same basic idea, same physics, same principle of how it works in the identical machine. In MRI though, what we're doing is we're taking one image. It's like taking out your camera and taking one snapshot versus in fMRI, it's like taking out your camera and doing like a burst. Um, I think of it almost like you're making a flip book. So that is um, what we're doing is we're taking lots and lots of pictures, static pictures of the brain, but we're taking them so quickly that we can sort of flip or integrate between them and look at how different parts of the brain are differentially being engaged in that cognitive process by looking at the differing levels of oxygenation levels in the, in the blood that's being sent to those different regions. So it's not quite right, but if you can think about it, if I took thousands and thousands of pictures and I flip through them, I can actually see that brain activity change. And I should be clear that you can't actually see it with the naked eye. Again, it's a super small signal, just like you're talking about with EEG. But after doing some statistical processing, you can see those changes um, resolve. Because the oxygenation level changes the way different types of tissues in the brain respond to the magnetic environment, regions that are engaged, more strongly engaged in processing in a given moment, end up looking different in the MRI images. Um, but like I just said, these differences are super, super, super small. And so we have to be really careful in the way they're analyzing the data so that we can know which changes are real and meaningful and actually tied to a cognitive process. And fMRI um, is like EEG is a super complicated technique and I've been studying it for more than 10 years. And so I really felt like I couldn't do it justice in just a couple of slides. And so I pulled a couple of really nice YouTube videos for anyone who's interested in following up more about it after this talk. Okay, so in case anyone's not familiar with what an MRI machine looks like, it kind of looks like a giant donut with a bed that can slide in and out of it. So when we're taking an image of the brain, you would have the participant lay inside the scanner, your head goes in, um, the machine is about wide enough that your um, sides of the machine might touch your shoulders a little bit wider or narrow, depending how broad your shoulders are. So we slide the participant in, the machine makes some funny knocking and banging noises. That's just the um, magnetic gradients shifting inside the machine. And then what we get back out is a picture of the brain. Fun fact, this is actually my brain. This is data of myself that I collected in graduate school. Um, it looks a little bit grainy and blurry, and that's because um, 
of the way that images work. It's not the same as taking like a photograph of someone where it's super clean and crisp. Um, and that's part of the reason also why we have to take lots and lots of images. And what I'm just highlighting here in these red circles is the structure that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more and that I've spent much of my career working on called the hippocampus. So the hippocampus, is one of the structures most closely affiliated with memory, although it's certainly not the only structure in the brain that is important for supporting memory. Um, here's a example of it in a postmortem brain. So this um, is a structural MRI image. We can see it here. It has these classic um, digitations. I always say it looks like the hippocampus is like coming to punch you because you can see these like lumps, like little knuckle lumps. Here's a, uh, another view of the hippocampus system taken taking from the side view. So as if I was slicing off my ear, or what's called the sagittal view. And again, I'm just gonna circle it um, so that you can, can see it more easily. And it's called the hippocampus because when people originally were dissecting it out of brains, they thought it looked kind of like a seahorse and hippocampus, I think it's Greek for seahorse. So on the left in this image is an actual hippocampus that's been dissected out from a brain. And on the right is a little seahorse. You can see why people thought they were similar. It admittedly, I have never thought a, a hippocampus in any of the data I've collected looks like a seahorse, but there we have it. Okay. So how does this work? So, so this is um, little stick figure Hallie who um, gets put into the MRI scanner. And um, this is like my little running stick figure Hallie, right? So this is my little uh, demo for we can think about the difference between oxygenation levels in the, in the brain. So this is sort of, we can think of it like Hallie at rest and Hallie engaged in a cognitive process. Um, and in this case, I need to take in more oxygen, right? If I'm running a race, I need to take in more oxygen than if I'm just sitting at my desk. And that's essentially what's happening. So the brain at rest, maybe all parts are equally being perfused with oxygen, um, oxygenated blood. And when I'm trying to think about something like um, retrieving someone's name, I might send more resource or my body would send more resource to the regions that are gonna help retrieve that information here, like the hippocampus, excuse me. And here's a depiction of what this looks like in actual data. This comes from Reese Sperling's group. So here we have um, average data across a number of participants. The coloration is just false color to help us depict the statistics that we're doing or that she's doing on this data. And what we can see is that we see really strong bilateral that is on both sides of the brain engagement of the hippocampus. So this is hippocampus. Um, I think actually I have little circles, yeah. Here's hippocampus that's being highlighted. Um, this is in the coronal view. Um, like I'm slicing off my nose, this is the sagittal view, like I'm slicing off my ears, um, and this is the axial view, like I'm slicing through my eyeballs. So what we can see is this really robust engagement of hippocampus um, in our fMRI signature. I think in this study, um, they were asked people to learn face name pairings, and so the brighter the color, the, the whiter, um, it is, the stronger the difference was. And we can see that there's sort of maximal engagement near um, this center of the, the hippocampal structure. Okay, so let's give you a little fMRI recap. I, I know we're running way over time, so I appreciate you all hanging in. So fMRI is a non-invasive method for measuring brain activity and relating it to behavior and cognition. It's actually an indirect measure of neural activity because we're not directly indexing the neurons firing between one another, unlike EEG. Instead, we think of it being sensitive to the changes in the oxygenation levels. And the way that I explain this to you that you can think of, although it's not you know, perfectly exactly what happens, it's like when you're running a race, you take in more oxygen. So when parts of your brain are more strongly engaged in a cognitive process, they're sent more of this oxygenated blood. It has really good spatial resolution. We can get down at least to the millimeter level, but pretty poor temporal resolution. And this is also related to the sluggishness of the blood response. So we think of it being on the order of, um, of seconds. So this allows us to localize activity to specific brain regions. So I think this was um, Abriana's question from before about EEG. So this is a real distinction between the methods that I could say exactly where we think um, a process is maximal, but it's hard for me to say exactly when something happened. Okay, so how do we link um, the brain with behavior? So we talked about two different ways. One is EEG. 
it's a direct measure of neural activity. It gives us good temporal resolution. We can say pretty much exactly when something happened with millisecond precision, but it gives us relatively poor spatial resolution. And we can contrast that with MRI or fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is an indirect measure of neural activity, it gives us poor temporal resolution only on the order of seconds and good spatial resolution. And these are two primary methods that I've used in my own research. If you're interested, there's a bunch of stuff up on my website and I'll put the um, link to that in the end of the slides as well. Okay. I have just a couple more slides, so I appreciate everyone hanging on. So I wanted to think about when is a good time to use these kinds of brain imaging techniques. Um, if we want to observe something that's implicit, so maybe something that we don't have conscious awareness of or conscious access to. So um, you might know that that sentence you read sounded weird, or you might know that you did or didn't remember that word, but maybe you can't exactly identify when you knew that that happened. Uh, it's not verbalizable, that's a great time to use a brain imaging technique like EEG or fMRI. If we want to adjudicate between competing theories, maybe one theory says you first um, remember a, a word and then you use your source memory to reject whether or not you've seen it, and we want to know the timing or where that operation occurs, and different theories make different predictions, another great time to use brain imaging. We want to think about linking a particular region to a particular process. So a lot of the early work was done trying to say, like, is the hippocampus involved in XYZ memory process? Let's see if it lights up. Or that is, let's see if it's more strongly engaged when someone's remembering something versus forgetting something. And to understand this link between structure and function. So I think of these two things, these two last bullets as being kind of related ideas. OK. But Brain imaging techniques like EEG and fMRI aren't the only ways to study cognition, and I want to just highlight a couple of other really important things. So one important way is using patient studies. So I already talked about using things like intracranial patients um, who are undergoing seizure monitoring. Um, this is another kind of patient. So this is Henry Meliason or patient HM, who's a incredible was a incredibly famous patient who is foundational to the study of memory. I would, I think, lose my memory researcher card if I gave a memory talk and didn't mention patient HM. And he actually was a patient who had epilepsy. And unfortunately, his epilepsy was non-responsive to medication. And they had to do some surgery to remove the tissue in his brain that was causing the seizures. Um, this is just a MRI scan showing that the asterisk depicts the tissue that had to be removed. Um, and there was some controversy when this surgery was done because the surgeon who did it took out a little more tissue than he needed to. So this brings up um, the really important issue about medical consent. Um, and um, we now really understand that the surgeon did something that probably was inappropriate, um, even though this individual patient HRM's seizures went away, he also lost a lot of his memory. Um, and there's some, been some fascinating um, popular science writing um, about him. I'm, I'm highlighting actually down here two of the most famous women who studied patient HM. Um, this is Brenda Milner, who initially described him. Um, she's now, I can't remember if she's 99 or, or 100, but she's still alive and she works up in Toronto. She's in, I'm sorry, in Montreal. She's incredible. And Suzanne Corkin, who um, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, who used to be at MIT. And these are probably two of the most famous people to be associated with him, with the study of patient HM. Um, and there is a recent... Um, right up in the times sort of questioning some of the ethics of studying someone who doesn't have their memory. Can they appropriately consent for themselves? Um, things like that. And I think, you know, we're really indebted and really grateful to, to this man for making so many contributions to science. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to think about the ethics of doing this work and to make sure we're doing it responsibly and with respect for individuals. Um, and for anyone who's interested when patient HM died, he was so famous that they live streamed um, slicing his brain and, and slices of his brain were sent all over the world so that scientists all over could, could study him. So um, I think that still is, is live if anyone wants to see, to see that for themselves. I remember re learning about this briefly, but so was the result that he couldn't form lasting new memories or and also like loss of all the previous memories? So patient HM couldn't form new memories, although there's a twist to that that I'll tell you in one second. And he had what was called, um, so that would be anterograde amnesia. And then he also had a little bit of retrograde amnesia. So 
he was missing some of the memories from before his surgery. So the way that it worked was he had memories from his childhood. Like you could ask him to draw, for instance, his childhood home and he could draw it perfectly. But if you asked him for stuff like in the, I don't know, like maybe six to nine months before his surgery, he was pretty fuzzy on it. And then if you asked him about stuff that happened after his surgery, even like his doctors that he saw every day, he really couldn't um, remember them. But the really interesting thing, and I think the, the, the twist in that is that he actually could learn some new information. He just didn't have conscious access to it. And we know this from a couple of seminal studies. So one is um, studies of procedural knowledge. So they did some work where he was asked to trace a star in a mirror. So it's actually a really hard task. Um, and what they showed is that he did it day after day after day, and his tracings got faster and more accurate. But if you asked him, Henry, have you ever um, have you ever seen this before? Have you ever done this before? He'd say, I have no idea what this is. So it's this real dissociation between you can learn a new skill and you can get faster at it. So showing that he does seem to have some ability to learn new information, but he couldn't actually tell you that he could. And I think this is one of the pieces of data that started to really challenge scientists to think about what is the role of the hippocampus. So if he didn't have a hippocampus, but he could still learn new information, the hippocampus cannot be the only structure that's important for memory. Um, there's some other interesting uh, studies along that line showing, for instance, that like he um, he could learn information if he had been presented with it lots and lots and lots of times. So like, um, I think the example is Ronald Reagan was an actor and became president after um, he had his surgery, but HM really liked to watch the news. And so he saw Ronald Reagan like a bunch. And so he like could report that this guy was an actor and like also liked politics. Like he could report some things that indicated that he must have learned some new information, but the way in which he learned it over lots and lots of repetitions was unlike how healthy participants would have learned it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and the other way that I think really gets short shrift in terms of how we can study cognition is just by asking people to do activities on the computer or in person, so doing some sort of standardized testing. I thought we could do a little uh, experiment here. So can anyone tell me which of these pictures they've seen earlier today, the one on the left or the one on the right? You can use the chat or you can unmute yourself. Can I guess the left? Yes. Yeah, Natalie would be right. So this is the, the picture that was at the beginning of my slides. These are my wonderful dogs, one of which interrupted us. Uh, let's see if we had some guesses in the chat. Yes, everyone's guessing left. Nice job, everyone. So um, we can measure responses. So we could just measure like accuracy. We can also measure, not in the way I just did the experiment, but we can measure something like response times. And um, we might make some prediction that for old items, we might be faster to respond. It's easier to remember something than to correctly reject a new item. So this is just like a really simple measure we can get. Um, when you hit a key on a keyboard, we can record how long it takes you to make that judgment. And I think that there's been some really beautifully clever work done to disentangle different sorts of cognitive processes just with these, what people consider basic ideas about behavior. So I wanna say that you don't have to be doing brain imaging to really understand some, some cognitive process. Okay, so how does the brain support memory? I started with this question at the beginning of the talk. And I wanna say that it's really still an active research question, which is great. It means I have a long career uh, ahead of me of questions that are still open to be answered in the field. Um, and I think we don't talk enough about the fact that science is a process and one that can take a really long time. We often are only seeing something that's the final result and something that a whole team of people have spent years and years and years working on. But one preliminary answer is that structures like the hippocampus, among others, seem to be critical for memory. Um, and I would encourage us to think about the brain as a network of interconnected areas that are working together rather than individual areas that are working in isolation. So it's not just the hippocampus that's contributing to memory, but the hippocampus is talking to lots of other structures and together they're supporting, um, supporting memory. 
Um, and we can use a variety of different methods and techniques to look at how this is happening. I talked today about behavioral measures, patient lesion studies, EEG, fMRI, and I didn't have time to discuss lots of other interesting things like MEG, FNIRS, ECOG, and lots and lots of others that I'm not even listing here. Okay. Um, and there's no way that I could have covered everything, and I don't know what's piqued people's curiosity, and so I wanted to just highlight a couple of other places you might want to go after this talk to learn about neuroscience or psychology or, or the brain in general. So there's some wonderful podcasts. Um, this one, Simply Neuroscience, is actually put together by an undergraduate um, team at Columbia, um, and there's lots of other ones out there um, focusing on all sorts of different things. There's been a lot of wonderful stuff being put out also for any individuals who are interested in thinking about pursuing PhD work, um, ideas about sort of identifying this hidden curriculum. Um, if anyone ends up wanting to go down this path and, and has questions, I'm happy to, to get in touch over email and, and answer questions, things like that. But this is just a small smattering of things um, that some of my colleagues recommended. And with that, I really just wanted to say thank you um, to everyone who was here and listened today. And thank you to my wonderful memory demo dogs, my puppy Izzy and puppy Theo. Well, he's no longer a puppy, he's two, but. And then this is my research group um, at Columbia, my supervisor, Mariam Alley and Christopher Baldassano, and the wonderful team of research assistants who's currently working with me. Um, and I'm happy to stick around and answer any lingering questions that people have. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you everyone for coming on your Saturday and joining. Yeah, please ask any questions. Thank you for having this session. Absolutely. Thanks for coming, Cameron.